Okay, it's time for another big one. This is a lesson that I've been thinking about doing for a very long time now, and I thought, if I'm going to do it, why not do it big and do it kind of extreme? So the subject of this um, lesson is dramatic imbalance, okay? I did a lesson one time in my beginning drawing class in uh, college where we, drew, we were doing still lifes, and we did a lesson on dramatic balance where we had... Um, a couple compositions that were almost identically kind of visually weighted and we you know balanced out our composition based on those two still lives okay and they were very similar they weren't exactly the same it wasn't like a doing a mirrored thing but then we did something where there was a gigantic still life full of everything there was chairs on top of tables and blankets and everything like that and there was this little tiny thing over here and we did the composition that way so there was dramatic balance you know with this really kind of this tension filled thing due to the uh, exact balance of visual weight on both sides and then there was this other one that we did in the same three hour studio class period where um, things were greatly imbalanced and uh, that was an excellent um, lesson for that day that I really enjoyed and, uh, and never forgot. So I thought we would do something in the spirit of that um, idea. I'm doing a, kind of a rule of thirds here type of thing, trying to figure it out. I'm not going to measure it out, but I'm going to put this horizon here down on this third right here. So that'll be roughly rule of thirds, and then we'll... Uh, I don't know. It's a very informal grid, but we'll see what we can do with this, okay? This is the meadow stamp right here, and I'm just going to stamp this across right here. Now, I'm not going to take a huge amount of time to color each one of these impressions and, you know, color those trees, you know, variations of green and whatnot. It would just take quite a long time for this, you know, 11 by 17 piece here. So what we'll do is we'll just uh, do kind of a monochromatic um, foundation here and then we'll bring in some colors later. All right, now this is going to look a little bit symmetrical because I mean, if I didn't draw this um, foreground tree, it wouldn't quite be as obvious, but we'll we'll break it up though, okay? So I'm not into this kind of picket fence style of stamping where everything looks the same from side to side, you know? If you know the stamps and whatnot, you'll be able to kind of figure out the references in terms of what images have been used where. Um, but when I get done with this, I don't want it to be quite so obvious that this has been the same stamp that will be stamped, you know, four and, uh, what, quarter times across this front of this page right here. All right. That being said, kind of overlap a little bit and whatnot. I see the, the space in between here. I could have taken the time to kind of blot off the edges before I stamped it out so that would kind of merge in with its sibling or its, you know, own impression across the front of this. But you re I don't really need to do that because I'm going to be bringing in some other things that will blend that all together um, in the end result anyway. So not, you're not kind of not really necessary to do it right now. Okay, now I'm going to combine a couple different lessons. I'm going to be, com be combining um, hopefully dramatic uh, imbalance here. I mean, I can do a dramatic balance too and make these things kind of perfectly, you know, the same, but I like that dramatic imbalance kind of idea here. But we'll also do something where we focus on spotlighting, okay? We're going to do this really heavy, um, visually weighted left hand side, and then I'll just do some kind of delicately uh, composed um, right hand side over here, and I'm thinking this little graceful little doe can be positioned down here against this towering, you know, piece of, uh, I don't know, granite stamped on the, uh, the other side. Okay, so anyways, going back to the merging of these, um, we're going to stamp in some additional textures in here. This is the Sedge Filler stamp. It's uh, a grass texture stamp. And your filler stamps are often one of those really key components to kind of bringing your different composition 
compositional elements together. Okay, but before I do all that, I forgot I was going to do a little bit of foreground as well. So this is the ledge stamp right here, and why don't I have this? Oh, in a couple spots. Yeah, I'll go something like that. Create this ledge right here. Uh, maybe I'll just leave it open over here. I'm trying to decide if I want another bit of this. I think I want this open. I want this kind of all the rocky elements, I think, on that um, left-hand side. Okay. So we added that in. I'm just going to stamp this kind of in the background here. Background to this foreground rock now. All right. And you can do this completely vertical. I, I think I'm, I'll go in a little bit of a slant here just for a little bit of change of a kind of angle, angles. Put some of that down here, like about like so. I have this larger piece here too. Oh, this is the grass texture. Maybe we can move that in here as well. Okay. All right, now that sets our, kind of our foundation right there. Um, I say kind of because I, I plan on bringing in additional elements within that space in the form of foreground here, okay? And uh, some other smaller elements within this uh, given space as well, so. Um, I don't know, I can do that right now too. Let, let's bring in a little bit more uh, texture here. This is my little tiny rock. I'm just leaving this on here because I'm just... I could use this in practically every scene. I don't know if I would use it for a sky scene or something like that, but... I just like this little element here. It it can kind of um, vary the space in terms of um, a different texture used here and there. It kind of breaks up the monotony of certain things like this grass in here. Okay, it's it's looking very similar, but it can unify. It can break up the monotony of a given texture in a given space, but on an overall whole, it can unify in terms of that similar texture. Okay. So we have both kind of the uh, softer texture as well as you know, maybe the crisp or something like that. It represents something like rocks. But just from a textural standpoint, even if it couldn't be rocks in a given area, it's just a nice kind of change of visual pace. Okay, so we have that stamped across there. You see how it kind of adds to that look in that space? You see how it really works in the background like that? It kind of carries the rocks a little bit closer to us. But you can do it though. Not having it in the design is kind of good because, see, I can stamp it in a much lighter value where it's more subtle, or I can do it in darker texture like that where it's more obvious. So you can play it both ways, you know, when it's in, you know, a separate uh, image. So that's one of the things about um, stamp designing um, that I always try to uh, really consider. Um, if you don't, you know, if I if I didn't use the stamps, it wouldn't be kind of as obvious as far as what to do with the images, but knowing how certain things come into play, um, there's always this balance between adding as much information into a stamp design, you know, as you can without kind of decreasing the, um, the variations of usage that you can do with that design. You know, I can add in a ton more detail in here, but it would limit our usage, okay? It would be inherent in the impression itself, but sometimes, you know, you don't leave enough to the stamper to kind of interpret and um, change around. So it's always one of those kind of balancing things. It's, it's not 
always easy to um, uh, to kind of figure out at times, but I don't know. I mean, it's easier for me now. Um, whatever, thirty years into it and whatnot, but um, you're always kind of kind of tweaking that um, that dynamic between um, those two issues, you know. Enough and too much. Okay, so this is a cloud cumulus. Now here's what I'm thinking about doing. There'll be this kind of granite um, rock structure over here. But by stamping some clouds below it, what we're saying is that those that granite um, those granite walls are so towering and majestic and high in elevation that you know they they're coming out from from the fog or the clouds or something like that and kind of towering above them by doing that. So you can give it give it a sense of grandeur. But the thing about clouds is they're very reflective in terms of light. So this is kind of a dark um, uh, horizon line right here. But by put, placing this in back of them like that, it's giving me an excuse for having something darker here and going to lighter before I get to the darker walls again. Okay? All right, so let's do a little bit of tweaking here. I've talked about um, the usage of this cloud before. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to wipe off the perimeter like this, okay? Because I have trees that I'll be stamping over down here. So I want that nice silhouette of those trees to still show. But if I'm stamping this in black, okay, the contrast between that those trees and this cloud won't be so extreme if I stamp this in black. So I'm blotting it off um, where it will merge into those granite walls and also where it's merging into those tree lines there. So I wiped on top and bottom, okay? Stamp it out like that. So you can see where it's kind of darker in the center right there. And it fades out up here. You can see where it's kind of more gray. And it's gray down here. I inked it up in black, all in black. But if you merely wipe off some ink, it's going to stamp out as a lighter version of whatever key, uh, hue you color it with, blues, whatever. All right? So the drier, the lighter. So you can really take your pads or whatever colors you're working with, that being said, you know, about the, uh, the drying aspect, and you can really push the capabilities of a given ink, whatever color it might be, just by removing some of it so you can get a much lighter version. You don't always have to just ink it up and stamp it out like that. You can wipe off certain portions if you have word stamps or something like that. You can give them a sense of dynamics by wiping off some of the top portion of it maybe. So when you stamp it out it looks like those lettering, that lettering, those word stamps are being top lit. And you can add in a sense of lighting into your uh, you know, simple words at happy birthday or something like that, you know. Or you can stamp, you can color them a certain color, you can wipe off, you know, some of the color and add a different color on the top so it looks like, you know, there's multi-colored um, uh, lights illuminating those word stamps or anything like that. But that being said, you can do it with, you know, what I'm getting at is you can do that with all of your different imagery. Okay, so adding that in, it's going to be um, kind of more dr dramatic type of uh, setting, I take it. Being that these clouds are a little bit darker and the contrast between uh, the clouds and the background is going to be fairly extreme because I'm stamping it in black. You don't have to stamp this cloud in black though, you can stamp it in a light blue and it looks like you know, the lightest, friendliest, you know non-threatening cloud you've ever seen if that was stamped in like a baby blue, right? Some people, one person, I don't know, sometimes people would see this indexing and say, well, I don't want a cloud like that because I don't want to stamp it stormy, right? And I would say, well, you just don't stamp it in black, you know? It's indexed in black because that's on the label, but that's not the color it's going to stamp out, you know, necessarily because we can color it any color, right?
Let's go for another impression up here. I'm guessing that'll stamp out lighter because I've, you know, going for the second impression like that. See so where I stacked it like that? Okay, I think that should do it. I don't want to go too extreme, okay? I don't want to build that up too much because I want that visual weight to be really kind of uh, apparent. Okay. All right, so these are my mountain stamps right here. They're kind of takes on a... Um, structures out in uh, Yosemite, but I, I changed them around because I don't want them. To, I, I never stamp out anything too reminiscent of anything really specific because it would limit kind of the usage of it, you know. Um, they would always represent a certain area if I made it too um, indicative of that of that site, um, but I certainly do reference it because I love these uh, these rocks out there. This one's like um, Yosemite Falls, I think. It's uh, Upper and Lower Falls, if you know that. But I was kind of following more kind of the, uh, the granite um, type that's out there and um, the way it's structured. Okay, now these, I will mask off some of these clouds because I want them to be fairly delicate. And this is going to go right in here and I'll stamp right over some of these clouds. Okay. And this stamp is really old here because I've hand indexed <laughs> the ink on top of that piece of wood. I always love those hand indexed um, pieces of wood because it really puts the craftsmanship into the uh, into the piece. But boy, was that a, a headache stamping out hand indexing wood back then. You never know. I mean, sometimes you'd stamp it out and you wouldn't get a good impression. There weren't like a, you know positioners that you can use with um, you know wood on you know block to block um, impressions. These are some images right here, actually, that I've used in my first advertisement ever in Rubber Stamp Madness. Um, what, did, what was that one? I just kind of did a, I just did a video on uh, some of that early advertising. It was... I can't remember what I wrote. It was, uh, I forgot what the, uh, the ad said. It was, maybe it, it was, it wasn't just stampscapes. It's something. Uh, I don't know. I'll remember it one of these days. This one's El Capitan, if you watch that uh, free solo movie. I think this is El Capitan, more like that. But then I put this here, because if I did that, there'd be this big empty space on the wood here. And I felt, felt that, yeah, let's give the customer more for their money so you kind of fill things out a little bit more to try and maximize the wood usage, because all stamps back in, you know, the mid to early 90s and I don't know 2000s or you know early ones were you know everyone was using wood mounted stamps so people bought uh, people bought rubber for sure but um, they were buying often buying just the rubber and mounting um, their the stamps themselves all right Let's see here. Uh, my desk is really clean, but I for I just where did my where did my cloud stamp go? I have no idea. 
right, let's see. Oh, here it is. It's upside down. No wonder. Okay, so I have my towering walls here, but I want to make I want to do this thing with spotlighting too, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put some clouds above these mountains right here. And I'm going to put a break in the clouds, you know, like, um, you know, where some light is um, coming through across here, down on the meadow, and it'll spotlight my tiny little um, dough. Okay, so... probably gonna have to do this video in two steps. I'll do the composition first maybe and the coloring second. Okay, same kind of a uh, exercise here where I'm kind of wiping off the perimeter and a lot off the top and eh, quite a bit off the bottom. Alright, let's see our masking right here. Something like that, okay? So you have some of it showing That. All right, now, I think I'm going to switch this around because I kind of want this um, space over here to be not so kind of open, I guess. So I, I'm going to have to change this where these kind of merge in with each other. So I almost never do this, but I'm not working this large either where I have... Um, kind of changes of uh, lighting sources taking place quite so um, abruptly, maybe? Alright, so, so see I have to kind of merge these right here, so these ones are kind of going like this, right? And these ones are like that, so I have to put one in here so I've wiped out the bottom where it merges in with that one. I've wiped it over here where it's merging in with this one, so we'll come like that there. It looks like a just a big soft billowy mess right now. I don't know if it looks like a mess, but it, it it's 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 pretty crazy. I'm definitely stamping by the seat of my pan, so to speak, right now, you know kind of not knowing exactly where this is going. I do, I do, I am curious a lot of times as to where, you know, things are going, so, um, when I'm doing my scenes, so. Um, I wouldn't say I worry about where it's going, because I'm just kind of taking a ride, you know, but it doesn't mean I'm not curious sometimes, or, um, curious to know where something is going and or how something's going to turn out you know so there's that part of me saying you're gonna do that and uh, I have confidence in the uh, stamps and whatnot so it's kind of like that inner voice saying, are you going to do that? And, uh, okay, uh, let's see how it goes, you know, that type of thing. All right, so here we go here. And I'll add on, like, three of these like this. Man, that is one crazy 
skyscape. Everything is fairly, well, it's very um, monotone. It's mono textured, okay? when you look at it like this in monotone so that to me um, as just kind of a foundation I'm curious about it but it, it's not working <laughs> you know if it was just that which of course it's not it's it's going to be something quite different um, but we'll see where it gonna goes here all right, now, boy, I really want to add in some of that foreground in here because I know that's the type of thing that will really bring things together. But um, first things first, let's really use a ton of um, ink on here, uh, you know, to define our kind of lights and darks within this given space. Um, that's going to be my light source coming through here and streaming down here. This is kind of a question mark as far as um, what I'm going to do with that. Um, it's a we'll see type of thing for sure. Um, boy, that would be a kind of an interesting space for a quote stamp up here based on what's going on down here. All right, let's just go with something. Uh, Memento London Fog. Thank heavens I got a re-inker for this thing because this 11 by 17 is going to take a lot of ink. As a matter of fact, why not ink up a little bit more? All right, it's going to be my very last. Okay, of course, it's my very last one that I looked at. I think I re-inked this already. But this is an instance where... I wouldn't say you, that you can never have too much, but I don't want it so sopping wet. All right, color box stylus tools. All my tools are kind of getting around the same age, and um, I do have some delamination happening with some of these sponge tips right here. If a sponge tip lasts me for 10, 15 years, and it starts to peel off, I am absolutely good with that, you know, with the amount of uh, times that I uh, use it and how heavily I use it. I don't use it roughly, though. I take care of my tools. But, um... That's a really great um, lifespan for uh, any given um, applicator brushes or whatnot. Okay, so I'm kind of adding this down. Well, I'm not kind of. I'm adding this into certain areas, okay? I do have a strategy for this, though. I usually like to leave my light on, like, waterfalls as something fairly reflective. I, I put a little tone in there already, so I need to be careful of the rest of it. But here I am. I'm coloring around my waterfall there so that that falling water stands out, okay? Now, this is going to be... A night scene. So I'm going to make the rock fairly dark, okay? Like that. And by doing so, I'll make those clouds stand out a little bit lighter by contrast, okay? It doesn't mean that I don't want any of this cl um, color in my clouds, okay? But I'll be applying that mostly where the clouds are dark. Okay, so the top portions of them are a little bit lighter, so I can color in the bottom portions like this and make them a little bit darker. I, I still want that tree line in there, so maybe I don't come in there with you know, too, many, too much of my darker tone that I'll be doing a little bit later, or after this one. Okay, so light source right here will kind of direct our lighting, or and reiterate that lighting idea by making the area around this a little bit darker so that that seems lighter by contrast. But it's pretty close to the light source, so I don't want to just absolutely tone everything out. Okay, it's selective coloring. 
And I know it's kind of a, it's confusing to kind of see lighting or to define it um, when you first start this out, but I've made it easy, okay, or easier. If you just look at the designs themselves, you'll see darker areas on the designs, okay? See at the bottom of these trees and these rocks down here? It's a little bit darker than this area, right? So what you do is you just apply that tone in those darker tone areas. You don't, don't have to use black. What you use is kind of lighter shades at first. And then if you want to use black, you can. You can build up to it. But adding the shadow, like if I put my hand right here, this shadow being cast right here isn't necessarily this black right here, right? It's just a lighter version of something. It's a lighter, you know, it's a darker version of this white right here. Sometimes you're reflecting some color off of it or something. But for the most part, you're just kind of adding in this little area of shade. Okay, see how that, uh, let's bring a little bit of tone right here into this area right here. But see, leave the top portion of it. So now that top portion of that cloud looks like it's being illuminated by that light, right? Darker area right here. Just add a little bit more tone into that area. Okay. Now you can see this darker area up here. Okay. But see, kind of leave the top of that cloud a little bit lighter right there. Okay. So we have these clouds going here, 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 here. So there's various layers of them right here. But you can see it's going dark, light, dark, light, dark. You know, roughly about. You don't have to be perfect about it too. What you do is you just kind of oscillate things somewhat and be selective in your color applications, your shading applications, okay? And by doing so, you create an element of light within a given space. Coloring the whole thing is just coloring, but selective coloring becomes shading and where you don't add that shade the lighter area becomes illuminated or reflecting light. So that's the difference between kind of coloring and uh, coloring for light, you know, or lighting, you know, your scene. And it's not just, uh, it's not just, uh, you know, scenic stamping. Chances are you've stamped things before and done this little vignette around your entire card, you know. You stamp something out, it said happy birthday in here, and you've kind of darkened it around here. If you have a little figure, you've darkened it around the perimeter. You're, in a sense, you've created lighting coming from within. All right, and that's all you're doing here. It's just kind of an extension on that idea. A lot of people think that they're not good with lighting, but they've already be do been doing it. You'd have to just kind of see where that um, applies um, to scenic stamping, you know, in terms of scenes or something like that. But, you know, you've been lighting, chances are, other types of objects already. You just didn't really kind of look at it. That. You probably thought of it as like framing or something like that, framing off a, an object or something like that, or kind of bringing more attention to it.
I'm kind of going against my inclinations here, my, my usual inclinations to uh, leave some areas lighter out here, but I think what will happen is this will be start off a little bit lighter and then I'll transition into darkness over here. Maybe that'll be better. Alright, so I'll kind of bury these clouds out here and, you know, I'll have a little bit of variation, but let's make this pretty dark out here. Changing the uh, textures, you know, of this uh, area right here, just coloring in some of these um, formations of the rock here. You don't have to color it neutral either. You can kind of come across some of these areas and make some of it darker, you know, some of it leave light just as you would in the clouds, and that will vary kind of the lighting that is hitting it and that kind of lends itself to kind of a richer space, okay? So don't always just see um, a certain object to be colored uniformly. It would be just like um, if some, you know, you had a little character wearing um, certain types of clothes, if you just, you know, colored that whole figure one color saying okay you're wearing all the same clothes that's all the same color the shoes are the same color 
you know, shirt, pants, whatever, jacket, gloves, everything the same color. Well, you don't have to do the same thing on this. Now, this mountain isn't going to be red and yellow and orange, you know, with a gold area on the bottom, but you can kind of change the, um, the values that you use within that space to lend itself to um, kind of um, a richer form just within that um, um, object itself. All right, so see that right there? It's just kind of coloring different areas right there. You know, a little streak here and here making the area around the water a little bit darker so it makes the falls stand out lighter by contrast, okay? Now, like I said in the beginning, I, I accidentally colored in some of my falls area, so if I just kind of take the area, I make the areas around the darker water, then the water that I accidentally colored with the gray will seem lighter by contrast. So you can't well, I mean, there are certain things I can do to make that water lighter where I colored it, but one of the things I can do is just work around it and make it darker so that it looks lighter. You're playing contrasts. Okay, coming in here. Okay, now I'm really building up some tone and making some areas a lot darker. All right. And I really want to... Uh, one of the things that I don't have going on right now is I don't have that spotlighting aspect of, you know, in here, where it's really kind of illuminated over here. It's really illuminated everywhere on this meadow, so I want to uh, kind of subdue that aspect of it a little bit more. I have some other trees that I'm going to be bringing into here too, so I know that will take care of some of this left side, but well, let's just darken up some of this, you know, and really pull the viewer's attention across this page a little bit more so.
kind of just reiterating. I'm building up um, things a little bit darker as the um, gray ink kind of dries a little bit more. Um, it's allowing me to apply kind of a thicker coat of the black. Where when this, this gray is really wet, um, it's kind of hard to apply it because it's so wet. It's just like trying to apply wet into wet, you know. It just, you know, you kind of end up lifting a lot of the color right off of the uh, your applicator when you apply it down because none of it's transferred because the surface is just so wet. So I can feel it here where it's just, it's allowing me to apply a little bit more. And I, I guess I'm not wiping it too. So it's allowing me to kind of build up those little micro beads of uh, ink. And uh, one of the things too is, you know, the more I do this, the more of the gray comes out of it and the more, you know, black is being uh, applied. You know, the ratio of gray to black, and it, you know, becomes uh, smaller and smaller um, from the gray uh, aspect of it. Doing a lot of tapping here, but you know, for the most part, I'm keeping the um, this applicator in a comfortable area within my body. Okay, so if you notice, I'm turning my page around. I'm not reaching and extending my like arm way over here and tapping it and tapping it. I'm keeping it within my kind of range of effectiveness. Okay, well that's really important with um, you know something like you know, a piece this size and the, the amount of repetitious, you know, rep repetition in terms of your movement. Keep it within your range of effectiveness where it's really comfortable, okay? And never really tapping this hard. So it's just like, you know, if I was going like this with my finger, this isn't really going to wear me out, you know, okay? So I have this. I'm not holding it tight either. It's just very loose. So it's just Okay.
All right, I think we're just about there. I always go a little bit darker in my corners, especially the four corners. Okay. And it, what other corners are there? Well, there's sometimes there's corners like um, you know within this given space as well. But if you kind of do the those four corners, it it will serve to kind of frame off your scene very nicely. And it kind of rounds things off a little bit in terms of the format of the, uh, you know, your rectangle. And it makes things a little bit more graceful at times. Okay, there's enough, enough. All right, I need some more stamps <laughs> for my foreground elements. Boy, look at that. So much glare on a, such a big piece like this. Okay, I could <laughs> introduce some color into the scene, and that was my kind of my initial intentions, but... I think I'm just going to go monochromatic on here just for the sake of the uh, the exercise and uh, you know what I'm really trying to uh, I don't know showcase in this um, composition. So all right, I still want to add a lot more visual weight to this side of the scene, okay? And I think the easiest way to do that is to go in here and add in some nice bold imagery. Okay, so we'll add a lot more kind of heavier elements right here in the foreground. Okay, this one is the, uh, the Pines and Rocks. I'm doing this in a Versafine because I, I feel I need that um, surface-oriented ink rather than going with dye-based inks right here. Um, to really kind of lend itself to uh, um, kind of this idea of dimension and uh, going from something dark in the foreground to something lighter in the background, even though everything has been stamped out in black. The Versify is just, uh, it's just, it gives, it gives a more solid dark very dark impression because pigment inks lay on the surface as opposed to staining um, like dye based inks do so, so hopefully this is, you know, like I said hopefully it's not so wet still you know that this won't apply as much as I want it to okay let's go a little bit higher. Let's go with a second impression of this. This gives me three trees all at once. I'll use some individual pines and maybe some different pines in here as well. Okay. Okay, now I'm not squashing this. I'm just trying to give this, you know, a eh, pretty decent pressure. You know, it's even good to, maybe I should stand up here. And I'm putting most of my pressure down here, not on the tips here, okay? But I want even pressure up there, but most of the uh, 
kind of the, the mass of this is down here, so that's the area that you have to kind of press into the most. You don't want to evenly distribute your weight over the, you know, the, the area. You want to distribute it mostly where the mass of um, your um, elements are. Okay. See how dark those are down there. Uh, let's try a different uh, pine as well. This is a little bit higher, maybe. Or I, I also have the spruce here. That's the one that I. used on uh, this scene right here, but I just used the, uh, the tips of it. This one has a kind of a thicker mass to it when you go out in kind of a pine forest. There's usually, you know, not just one type of a tree or pine out there. I don't know, in some areas maybe there are, but where I go there's usually different ones. Kind of interspersed, you know, within a given area in harmony with each other. Okay. I'm trying to think if I want to go with this one. I could, but let's go for a different shape in here. Um, I need my big one. Oh my gosh. This tacky peel is so tacky when you wash it off. <laughs> it's... It's, uh... It's like brand new in terms of the tackiness. It's not brand new, but um, it feels so tacky. Okay. Um, leafless pine. Large. I think it's 371G. I've been writing this code so much. I've been using it on a lot of recent uh, scenes. I kind of memorized it. Uh, memorized the code at least. Right, I need stuff out of my way here. This is such a gigantic scene. Let's go over here. Let's use a let's use a fairly big uh, impression of it. I'm going right across that meadow up into the uh, the clouds. Yeah, it stands to reason that kind of one of the tallest older pines right here is uh, dead. It's the type that it sticks up high, so it's you know stronger chance of it getting hit by lightning. using about maybe half of it here.
All right, I think my foreground is almost done. Let's take a look and see what it looks like here. Okay. See that? I'm kind of still composing in my head, trying to figure out if I want anything else in here. Um, I think I will add some of this reed over here. We'll see it's on a little bit of a different plane. Maybe this is closer to us or something like that. going on here right now. It's a little kind of framing device right in there. We have that light coming through there. I'm trying to make I don't know, stuff look I don't know, majestic or I don't know, whatever. In terms of lighting. Okay. Um, I am going to stamp this in dye based ink, I think. I want it to stand out, but I I want to be able to go over it with some pigment ink if I want. Um, white pigment ink to give it a kind of a hazy mist around it, maybe. I don't know. So I've wiped off some of the feet so it looks like it's kind of standing in grass. A little bit more, okay. And this kind of dynamic coming right across here, shining on our little subject matter down here. Okay. This is kind of standing off down there. Stand it up fairly light. Uh, okay, where did my new applicator go for uh, pigment ink? I've got all these stamps everywhere. Piled around because of the, the size of this. All right, cotton ball. This is doing, <laughs> it's doing a good job for me um, in terms of how I use it, uh, how I've been using it on a couple of the previous scenes, recent scenes. And I just I'm just taking some white pigment ink. This one's the Hero Arts one. Okay, and let me switch this around towards me. Blot this off a little bit. You know, get it kind of evenly spread on the cotton ball and let's add a little bit of this tone up in these clouds, kind of making the edges, just kind of the overall impressions of them a little bit softer. Maybe it'll look like kind of the light is kind of hitting these um, clouds and diffusing them a little bit. Switch off to kind of the dry side of it and kind of blend that out a little bit, it kind of gets a little bit uh, textured, clunky looking. I haven't mastered this at all. You know, the full cotton, I, I use pigment quite a bit, but um, uh, kind of figuring out this um, whole cotton ball aspect of it, application aspect. Okay, I'm kind of just tapping it down, spreading it around a little bit that. If you add too much, just kind of tap it off a little bit. Alright, let's get some on these uh, clouds kind of facing that 
lighting, that really soft lighting. It's hard to tell where, <laughs> where that ink is on here. Okay, let's take a look and see what that looks like. Okay, you see that lighting in there is a little bit softer, kind of cascading out like that. That'll draw a little bit darker too, so I'm going to leave it as is. It kind of stands out a little bit too much from a textural standpoint, a, kind of a different textural standpoint. I, I want it to be a little bit more in harmony with everything around it, but it will dry darker, so I'm just going to leave it. And then especially if I spray it, that isn't quite so obvious, so sometimes I have to go off kind of anticipation more than visuals right now, but I think it looks okay. All right, so I'm taking a Q-tip here. Maybe this one's been used too much. It's kind of really frayed. And wobbly, let's see, right here, okay. Let's get a little bit of ink on here. I blot it out. I don't want it to be blobby. And I'm going to put that around my little dough like it's in kind of a similar fog or mist that's around my light source. So it's giving my little dough something in kind of relation to the light source. You know, so this is the reflected light down here in a common texture, so it's creating a little bit of a relationship with that space up there. Okay, and we can do the same. <laughs> All right, let me let me move this out. Here. This is really uh, inked up here. I'm not, uh, let me see, I can use this other side. Reduce, reuse, right? I'll just, I just flip that piece of paper over. Okay, so some down here in these uh, waterfall, uh, waterfalls, I'll just try to make them a little bit more kind of uh, illuminated in mist. There's a lot of churning water down here at the base of a large waterfall and that kind of mist from all that suspended uh, spray down here and if you go out in the moonlight over at what is it lower falls you can go watch the moon bows during a I don't know if it has to be a full moon It'd probably be a couple days off or late but who knows um, I'm kind of adding this just wherever um, there's um, a light enough area where light meets dark. But here we here we have it right here. Look at that light streaming through there and kind of illuminating those falls right down there with that spray. See what it looks like. That illumination. Then we go over here. 
and we travel along and then here's that little dough kind of in the mist and it has that same texture that we see happening around our light source so it's kind of creating that relationship down there between um, light source and reflected light and hopefully this is uh, kind of as a good example of dramatic imbalance right here and maybe even more so spotlighting okay so like I said this area out here is um, kind of bare to me I don't want too much attention being brought to it because you know the whole thing is this down here but um, oh, let's let's start with this one down here All right. Gosh, I don't know how long I was kind of working off camera. Uh, maybe in editing I can edit that out. Okay, let me put a few little highlights down here. A little bit of moonlight, moonlit. Um, highlights on uh, some of the grass, grass textures. Um, could be a pearly everlasting or something like that in the meadow which is being kind of reflecting more moonlight I don't know whatever it is it's just kind of some added texture and crisp elements within kind of a darker field All right, now this is one of those pieces that I really need to take a look at with fresh eyes, I believe, in the morning. But there's those stars up there. But I need to see kind of what else could be done to uh, kind of uh, further kind of define this big piece right here. So I think I'll rest on it, but it won't be like big color additions or something like that. Like I would think about my, maybe some silver on here or something like that, or, or additional gel pen work maybe. That's kind of helping it. You know, there's a lot of kind of really general um, applications of uh, ink in vast areas within this given space, and um, it it seems to benefit. <laughs> Not surprisingly so, but uh, from, you know, these additional little touches like this, so maybe if I do a lot of that, you know, or, or a lot more than I have right now, it'll kind of uh, help to uh, define the space a little bit more in some kind of much more detailed areas.
Okay, so we'll let this dry. And plus, I'm getting, getting paranoid of uh, touching this down here. That's really going to remain wet for a very long time. Um, right now, if I touch it, it'll just slide. Tomorrow, it'll probably be a little bit tacky, but you know, I can't just like smear it across there, so it'll be easier for me to handle this piece, though. Okay, so part one, wow, of this piece. And I think I'll be doing, trying out some of that time lapse in the editing process here, so uh, make it not so quite so long. Okay, step or part one. Okay, I'm back after letting this um, set up overnight. It's probably been about, oh, I'm guessing about nine hours or so. Let's test the, uh, the Versafine. Huh. Now that's kind of surprises me that it's not tacky. I guess it's fairly dry. I wouldn't trust it if I rubbed my finger across it, but, um, but it's dry enough to the touch, okay? So anyways, that's one of those things about um, pigment inks on glossy cardstock. Um, they have a reputation for not drying, uh, for good reason. It's because a lot of the, uh, the um, pigment inks won't dry on uh, cardstock, glossy cardstock especially, for quite a long time. But the Versafine seems to have a kind of a shorter drying um, time than, uh, than many of the early incarnations of uh, pigment ink and the ones that are probably still out there too. I don't, I don't know if people use Versafine for embossing. I, I guess you could because it's wet enough for a while. I'm moving all my stuff out of the way here because I plan on doing some uh, additional um, detailing here. I feel that the uh, after letting this sit out, I feel that those those little details in there with the uh, the white ink are pretty. Um, uh, I don't know if I'd say crucial, but um, they're pretty important for bringing introducing small subtle detail into um, into the composition because there's so much of uh, the uh, dye-based ink coloring that has been executed in this scene that a lot of the um, the forms become very very subdued to say the least um, these areas right in here and the clouds and whatnot. The areas down here in the meadow in, in, the, in terms of the trees. Um, which we kind of wanted, but it's a good idea to go back in and add in some sort of textural um, element within those spaces if you can. And we can with, uh, you know, different types of media such as this uh, pen just to introduce a crisp textural element and it happens to be um, introducing light back in those areas as well in the form of you know a little dot a little pinhole of light you know kind of a thing going on so anyways let me see if I can see some of these little highlights on the top surfaces of some of these clouds. I wouldn't put it over here because we're saying that light isn't hitting that. But in those lighter areas, just where the white would show up, like in the gray areas, the little tiny element in there. And see these little dots on tops of these rocks right here.
Okay, so this is kind of traveling down uh, that little highlighting effect uh, is very sparse down here in these clouds, but it is present, so I think I don't think it'd be on well it'd be on a visual level, but uh I don't think people would be thinking about this. But there's more dots up there, there's more highlights over there, and as it moves down here, like I said, it gets more and more sparse in terms of my application of this. So it talks it it, it talks to the, the strength of this lighting right here and how it just kind of weakens a little bit more as it moves away from here. And now here, I mean, I really have it quite illuminated, so let's call this kind of the residual light of, like, a, kind of a spotlight hitting off this area right over here. Things don't, I mean, you don't have to make it literal, like, no, if that's light there, then how light would this be, okay? It's not like that, it's just, it's really kind of more about emphasis. What do you want? What areas do you want the viewer to focus on or land on? Where do you want to direct their eye? And that would involve how light you make a certain area, how dark you make the surrounding area, you know, in terms of that spotlighting type of effect. Like, if this was as light over here, um, it wouldn't be, uh, this this little area wouldn't be as prominent, okay? And I might pull the viewer's eye out this way, kind of with anticipation, you know? Th so think of this like a, like a stage, you know? It's, it's whatever you want your viewer to, viewer to focus on, or to ha what, you know, area do you want to create a kind of a landing spot for their, uh, their, it's it's their um, landing spot for their their visual path that you take a viewer on, okay? And you can do that in your scenes. A viewer will jump from spot to spot, you know, if you take a look, you know, depending on what you highlight. Like if this was all in dark right there. I, you know, that would just be kind of a lost area, which would be fine too if you wanted to be, wanted it to be very subdued. And if this area up here was lighter, I think they would do, I don't know, maybe they do something like this, or maybe they just take a straight path, and then maybe they circle back around that waterfall because it is light, or I don't know, maybe go down like this. They had to see the light, and there's just like this pouring light down that way with the uh, the waterfall. I don't know but um, they generally would follow the light path. Maybe they would start at the, uh, they might start at the, the doe, you know. Any type of little creatures or person in a scene, our eyes tend to go straight to that if those are in there, if I had a cabin or something like that. Um, the viewer, I would, you know, kind of, start off with that, it would really draw our attention. Okay, putting a little bit of splashes around that, um, falling while the churning, you know, where the water's churning. But I think that looks okay. I'm debating on whether I want to add a few little highlights on some of these trees. If I do that, it'll look incorporate them into the piece texturally. And if I don't, it creates a little bit more of a separation between the background. I mean, there's various levels of that, too. I can put a few on there, and maybe we'll have kind of the best of both worlds. So let me try that here. Okay, so I'm putting this on the side of the tree facing that light. I see it as moonlight coming from behind that, you know, those clouds. Okay, so just putting a few, especially on the, uh, these leafless trees. 
try to draw on them with this in mind, not having to do it, but if they, we do it, um, just perfect little opportunities for that. Okay, and now, where this one's kind of a little bit more uh, under, or the lighting's coming from overhead, then I'll put the uh, highlights on both sides of these branches here. But where it becomes a little bit more um, right, a, right side oriented here, I'm putting more of the highlights on the left side of the... Uh, the form, but that's not to say you can't put some on the other side. I'll just be a little bit more dominant. Okay, um, let's put some on the. I think it looks pretty good. I'll put some on these pine trees as well. Spruce. I, I think it helped it. I like that incorporation of the uh, the forms from textural standpoint. So in other words, this little dot represents um, stars, okay, and things like highlights. I guess it's basically those two, stars and highlights. A um, little bit of splashing around the, uh, the waterfall area. So it can represent a lot of things and it can do a lot of things. It adds light into dark. It separates things from a distance standpoint, you know, like you put a few little highlights on that and it separates it from that textured background, okay, or that tonal background, sorry. And then it unifies things from a textural standpoint, even if it doesn't represent stars down here, that little dot is the same as that dot those dots up here. All right, so you can see right here. So little highlights on those trees. See it on that pine tree? Or the dead pine. Then down here, we have it on the, uh, whatever, the forest meadow floor, like that. And then when you look at it as a whole, I don't, you know, we're not so aware, oh, look at those dots everywhere, or something like that. It just reads as, uh, you know, part of the lighting. It's hard to get the scene without all that glare. Such a huge piece. Okay, so... I could add it to these reeds, too, but I, I'm not going to. I, I think it'd be overkill. I don't know, is there such thing as overkill? That's one of those things I need to uh, get into. I'm doing an article for Rubber Stamp Madness, um, and I need to do a couple sample scenes, but the, uh, the subject of the article will be um, gel pen usage. And I use it a certain way, you know, so it'll just be from kind of my perspective. All right. Sometimes if you look at a piece upside down, it it might reveal other things to you in terms of uh, what you might want to do. They say that um, there is this kind of art technique, it was called drawing on the right side of the brain, where people, usually non-artists, um, draw something or whatever in the beginning of the class you're supposed to draw a picture of you of what you think you look like and then through this course study you draw other types of forms and whatnot and oftentimes they turn things upside down so that you wouldn't be so concentrated on what the form actually was but you'd be like a bird or a feather or something like that. But when you turn it upside down, you're just, 
your brain kind of just sees shapes and things like that. And you're able to kind of more focus on kind of the actual, what the shapes actually look like as opposed to what you think they should be, you know. And you're able to draw kind of a more effective representation of that object and then you flip it over and voila, it's a, it's a much better drawing of your portrait of your face or something like that. But the problem was with that, I mean, I think that was really effective, but one of the things that was kind of a little bit silly was, uh, or I don't know, it's a little bit of a deceptive thing. I know this is going off on a tangent on that thing, but um, they, you drew, I didn't take the class, but my roommate did, and I always wanted to, but it, I just didn't have time in my uh, schedule to do it. Um, but they drew, you were to draw a portrait of yourself from memory at the beginning of class. You couldn't look at anything. <laughs> so everyone's little things look like this little nothing portrait, right? And then the last thing you did in class was draw another portrait of yourself. This is a silver pen right here. So it's uh, kind of just blending in with the surrounding area, but it'll give you a little bit more of a kind of a highlighted, see that it kind of comes alive uh, when it captures some of that light. But at that end of the year portrait, the final drawing that you did, I think they had themselves looking at a mirror of themselves or something like that, or, or, or they photographed themselves and then they turned it upside down and they turned their paper upside down. So they're going off that photograph So that seemed to be uh, a little bit strange to me. Like, look how much you've improved. But, the, you know, the first one, you weren't looking at a picture of yourself either. You were just going off of memory. All right, and this is, looks like a, a darker gray metallic. It's one of those little subtle things that's it's kind of fun to do. You know, these metallics right here. Because where I add it in, in given areas, it's the same exact value or color. But when you, when it captures the light, it has that reflective quality. And there's this little extra reward for someone to do further inspection of your piece. You know, to really look down at the details when you have little things like this going on. Things that are very subtle. This is what's nice about these uh, sets of, this is the shuttle art um, gel pen set and there's metallics as one of the, uh, the ranges within this set. And look at this, this is three different values of silver metallic like that. Okay. These pens are really inexpensive. They're, 180 different colors for I bought my set at the time. It, it seems like things fluctuate. Here's another one. This one's even lighter. Looks like I had it out of order here in my little box, but um, these sets cost, or that 180 color set cost me, um, I'm looking for a gray, I don't see it. It cost me $25. For 180 colors, but I sound like one of those infomercials. But that's not all. <laughs> but the, those 180 colors came with um, refills for every one of the colors, so you get you know um, they call it 360, but it's it's really 180 with uh, 180 refills. So pretty good. I think I've had to switch out one of the uh, the refills on one of the pens, but by and large, everything else is working fine. You know, I'm not having that clogging issue. The pen inks are a little bit um, thinner than uh, some of those initial incarnations of gel pen sets that used to. I got about one uh, big old thing at Costco one time and. Uh, 
I don't think any of the pens worked after a few months. And I don't think I used it initially right off, you know, right away, so I I think a lot of the colors, I don't even have it anymore, tossed it. Um, a lot of the colors brand new didn't even work, so I know, and a lot of you know exactly what I'm talking about, because that's one of the first questions when doing gel pens. We had such bad experiences with them early on in those early incarnations, but the, the adult coloring book market really... Um, provided kind of the impetus for the creation of um, kind of these inexpensive sets from these different companies. So what they've done is they've kind of, to improve the, uh, the longevity of the uh, gel, pen, gel pens, they've thinned out the ink so it doesn't clog up as much. So they're, you know, they, the marks that you're doing with them are a little bit more translucent. Okay, so if I put a white dot over black, okay, it's going to, going to look a little bit more gray because you see some of that color coming through. But that's fine with me if the pen works, you know, I, I don't want some pen um, clogging up on me and, or not working right out of the gate. It's uh, really frustrating. Okay, so I think we're done here. Let's take a look at this and let's take a look at these uh, little areas in here. You can see those little dots in the clouds? They're like little lights, you know. And this is what it looks like, you know, at arm's distance. So it's not like we're focusing on like a little, you know, tiny little specks everywhere, okay. Let's see what those do. Right there, see it back in the meadow too. It kind of brings those areas to life. And especially with all that color application. I might have put too much down here in the meadow, but it's subtle because it's kind of light on dark gray. I mean, light gray where it starts moving out into the uh, darker areas, it's a little, you know, it stands out more. But there's a lot of dots down here. Here it is, kind of bringing that area to life back there. I do have a few little dots up there. And then here it is up in the sky. You can do it kind of, would be cool as a, maybe a band of a, like a Milky Way or something like that would have been interesting as well. I'm just leaving it as is because I don't want this area to be too I don't want it to stand out too much. I just kind of want it to be, I don't know, just this hazy thing up there. And I, I grayed it out too, so it wasn't as light as that. So it's it's much more of a kind of a secondary area in terms of the visuals. So, all right. Hopefully that was a good example of um, dramatic imbalance. We have a lot of things going on right here on that half of the scene. I've kind of made it kind of a, a triangular format here for, for compositional reasons. You see that right there? I don't know, they say that triangles in composition are kind of nice, but it kind of goes like that, all right? This area in here is kind of bare, I don't know. I, I still, I, I don't know, maybe I should put some sort of a um, quote stamp up there would be kind of interesting. I'll, I'll have to take a look through that. If I do that, I'll, <laughs> I'll come back in this video right here. But um, it's really about this spotlight area right here. And here's this tiny little element, okay? This is a, it's almost like a three quarter inch by three quarter inch um, design amidst a uh, 11 by 17 double page, full page spread. I think they call this tabloid. And that really becomes kind of the focal point in the scene, I believe. And then we kind of look back up here, I think, you know, I don't know. I think people might look at the scene and look up here or something like that. But there's this type of um, diagonal di dynamic going on between light source and reflected light and subject matter within that piece. Without that little guy down there, though. I mean, it's really missing something, right? You need some sort of landing spot object in the scene in order for it to be really kind of uh, be complete. So, all right. It's kind of a good exercise for me, too. I just went with the, the monochromatic. 
I wanted to uh, talk about um, you know composition and lighting for the most part in this one and just sometimes just doing a monochromatic is the most effective way to do that because we don't have to uh, kind of get focused in on um, things like intensity and hue and temperature within the scene and it's a good exercise to get into I'd recommend doing these monochromatics once in a while um, to just kind of increase your um, sensibilities when it comes to um, value and your usage of value and these types of exercises can certainly be done on you know smaller formats and uh, to really play around with um, lighting and shade because you can really see those types of aspects within a scene when you're, we're not kind of focused in on color. Color is kind of more of a, it, it, it introduces um, kind of more an expanded kind of emotional um, repertoire in terms of uh, your tools that you can use, but um, this is kind of like a good exercise. I, I love um, black and white photography and uh, artwork and things like that, drawings and uh, prints and drawings and uh, sketches so um, to me this is uh, I don't know it's kind of a natural thing to do but um, I do believe that just for anyone too it's a great exercise to get into and then you can do these kind of monochromatics like this too and if that doesn't sit well with you in terms of just the exercise and process of itself, you can take these black and whites like this, and just like black and white photography, you can tint these with kind of light um, values of certain types of hue. So it gives you kind of more of that black and white colorized um, and color tinted uh, prints like people used to do in old fashioned photography when, you know, before. Um, uh, color photography and then people you know would continue doing that just for the nostalgic look of it so that's kind of a fun thing to do and when you have kind of all of your values your value scale and lighting and all that kind of established just kind of tinting it with some really faint um, color schemes or whatnot is really fun to do and it's fun to kind of introduce things like te uh, temperature into a, uh, a monochromatic piece so Anyways, fun stuff. I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you watch this um, all the way through, uh, you have a lot of patience, and uh, thank you for tuning into the channel.